How's everyone? Well, let's do a, a thumbs up. You're doing well. I know it's warm, but we're doing well. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for attending this talk. And I just want to say a big thank you to B Sides Las Vegas for accepting this talk. It is always an honor to be here. Back in 2018, I actually volunteered here and I didn't know anyone in this industry. It was pretty daunting and scary, as you could possibly imagine. But I made a bunch of friends and they opened the doors for me. I got a job in Bug Crowd and I ended up getting into the hacker space all because of this conference. So I'm always so grateful and thank you to the Bolt. And you know, next year, if you want to think of something to do, volunteer. It's an amazing experience. So we're going to go into in a little adventure. And I'm going to try to make a security for AI talk that is a 101 a little bit more exciting. I know content can be kind of dry. So we're going to have a little bit fun. To start us off, you could win a prize at the very beginning of this talk if someone can tell me what do they see in the tree? And with that, I'll give you a beautiful threat report that has basically, it's like a miniature textbook about everything that you need to know about security for AI. Does anyone see what's in the tree? This photo was taken in Oakland, California in a little park called Lake Merritt. Does anyone see it? All right. Hummingbird? No, not a hummingbird. Any shout out if you know it, it's okay. You're correct. Congratulations! You won a report! Let's give a hand of applause. Yes, good job. All right. So, yes, this is actually a squirrel and they have evolved. They got in a jar of Jif peanut butter. I looked in the chair, I was like, what is that? Is that a squirrel? What is it holding? It's not peanuts. What? It's a Jif peanut butter. It's learned. And it knows it can't get the top off. So it went from the bottom, which is easier. Ah, so intelligence. Anyway, I bring this up because you're going to hear some really, really bad jokes. And by bad jokes, I am not a comedian, but I will try today. Um, so here is a corny joke. You guys ready for this? Why did the squirrel bring peanut butter jar to the AI lab? Because I heard the algorithms were nuts about data. Oh, uh, yeah, OK. Um, so a little bit about myself. My name is Chloe Masai, and I'm the head of threat intelligence over at Hidden Layer. I'm also one of the founding members of Disclose.io and a board member for Diana Initiative. Who went to Diana Initiative two days ago? Yeah. I'm also the advisory board member for the Election Security Research Forum. Those are my links. If you want to do me a favor, uh, marketing from Hidden Layer would love if you could take a photo of me while I'm giving a presentation and send it to me because I don't have someone here to do that for me. So if you can, DM me. I will, I will figure out what to give you. All right. So we're going to do some true and false questions throughout the talk. And I want to make sure that no matter what your background is, that I think you would feel comfortable enough to be able to answer if it's true or false. Using what already knowledge you know, you should be able to try to figure out what could be the right response. So first one, white box testing methods are unnecessary for assessing the security vulnerabilities of AI models because black box testing suffices. If you believe this is false, raise your hand. Congrats. You got one right so far. There's 10 of them, by the way. Not in order, though. One more. Implementing differential privacy can mitigate risk associated with data leakage in AI systems without significantly compromising model performance. If you believe this is false, raise your hand. If you believe this is true, raise your hand. It is true. You got a point. Keep track of your points just for the heck of it for yourself. All right. So when we think about AI or how the world sees AI, it tends to be a little bit of this, which is basically like Terminator world or end of the world situation. And yeah, I can understand the doom and the gloom here. but. I also believe there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation about AI, and especially when it comes to security for AI. So one of the things that we did come out with was the threat report, which our wonderful person in the front won the physical copy, but it is also, you can find it online, it's free. 
but it really helps to paint the picture. So after this talk, if you need a refresher, feel free to go and get the report. It has a lot of this in there. So we're going to talk a little bit about AI. So the thing is, AI is here. It's not going anywhere. It's like no one can use ChatGPT. We've all used ChatGPT now, and we're not going to stop using it. The thing is, it's already out there. And you know, you know it's going to get even more so ingrained in our everyday life. It's when our smart fridge starts judging us on our midnight snacks, like another slice of anchovy pizza, Bob. But to be honest, let's be fair with one another. It's not really the pizza slice. For me, it's the anchovies on the pizza. That just doesn't seem right. Anyway, when we think about how do we secure things, are we going to be OK? We've been here before. We've been here before when it came to the cloud, when it came from PC. So we are, we're, we are all learning together. And we're maybe playing a little bit of a game of catch up. We did do a survey to find out, you know, what do people think when it comes to some of the serious issues? About 77% of companies report that they did identify an incident with their AI within the past year. And that 1.7 thousand models are in use at organizations. And one of the trends that we did see in the past two years was when you ask a CISO, how many AI models do you have? They didn't have an answer, or their answer would be, we don't use AI. We have no AI. And then they come back like, OK, yeah, we actually do. I found out. I was never told, because let's be honest, it's always that we're in silos with one each other. Then you have the 98% of IT leaders believe that this is so incredibly important when it comes to their organization's success. I don't understand that 2% though, like it doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to just say that it's probably robots in disguise. I'm just putting it out there because this doesn't make sense. Um, anyway, so let's go talk about the risk related to the use of AI. But true or false, let's do it. So AI models can be protected against model stealing attacks by limiting the number of queries allowed to the model and by using techniques like query obfuscation. I should learn how to pronounce that pretty well. Raise your hand if you think this is true. Raise your hand if you think this is false. Raise your hand again if you think this is true. Wow, you guys, the true ones are correct. Don't worry, we're going to cover it later on. We'll all be on the same page. All right, next one. Watermarking AI models can help in identifying and proving ownership, which can prevent unauthorized usage and intellectual property theft. If you think this is false, raise your hand. If you think this is true, raise your hand. You are correct. It is true. So when you think about AI, of course, one of the concerns is harmful content creation. We're going to be afraid of what could be out there, because we also don't know what is it trained on as well. So try to think of it as AI is like giving a toddler a paintbrush and expecting it to do the Mona Lisa for us. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be messy. And sometimes it will feel like, at times, this is why we can't have nice things. We also have to worry about deep fakes because, I mean, has anyone, do you guys remember the Joe Biden robocall that happened earlier this year? Yeah, that, that to me is kind of election interference, in my opinion. And then you have this case of Hong Kong. Raise your hand if you read about this case in Hong Kong. All right, so this is a fun one to read about. So there was this guy at a company, it was late at night, and he thought his chief financial officer needed to jump on a call with him on Zoom to try to get 25 million paid out. So he jumps on this call, and it's a deep fake. It is so like his boss that he does not think that this could be a deep fake. And to be honest, I don't blame him. In the New York Times a few months ago, they actually came out with a quiz to test your skills out if you could tell the difference between something that is AI generated or not. And it was very common that people did not get 100% correct. I mean, deepfakes are starting to look so good that I'm actually starting to be in doubt of really if those are my Shiba Inos in my Instagram photos. Because I mean, look at them, they're so cute. 
That's Sherlock, by the way. And that's Luna. Anyway, they're amazing. And they don't usually do that, by the way. They do this thing called the side-eyed, where they judge you on every little point. Now, data privacy. This is a good case with Samsung. So one of the things that is that they found that there was media notes and source code that was actually leaked in ChatGPT. I knew about a year ago or two years ago, let's just say, some companies were banning employees from using ChatGPT. During this time, what employees would do is like, well, it makes my life easier and I don't want to do that. Well, I guess I'll just do it on my personal devices. So what do they do? They take whatever that they need to create reports or anything, they send it to them via email, to their personal email address, to use their personal computer to do ChatGPT on it, and then get the results and then plug it back at work. And what this happens to do is that it leaks sensitive information out. And this is why you shouldn't ban ChatGPT, because then you have these things. So the one way how I always think about like data privacy with AI, just think about that there is always going to be a possibility that a secret will come out. Just like on reality TV shows, someone's going to spill something, of course. And then you have copyright violations where artists are like, hey, how did you train your model? I'm out of curiosity because I believe you're using my stuff. So this has been an ongoing issue because we don't know what models are trained on. It's a very much like, as a consumer, you don't know. And so that is still a rising problem that still needs to be addressed to this day. Then you have biases. I always say, and even before AI, Let's be honest with one another. If you don't have diverse folks working on a product, it's not going to work for everyone. That also means that you're not going to capture all the bias out there. This is why it matters on all these fronts. But also, where did you get your data from? That's so important because that can really cause so much harm to populations if we don't check these things. And just think about AI bias. It's like an AI deciding that anchovies belong on pizza, which is so fundamentally wrong. By the way, I'm so sorry if you like anchovies on pizza. I just, no. I, it, I could say pineapple belongs on pizza, but I don't want to create a debate or a situation in this room by saying that, so yeah. Anyway, and then you also have to worry about ethical AI. And this was one of those cases of an AI chatbot that encouraged someone to plot to kill the queen. And the way how I always think about ethical AI, it's like, Try to train your dog not to bark at the UPS delivery person. It seems impossible, but it is possible to do so. With Sheba's, I don't know. It's a little bit hard. They're kind of a hard ones to figure. So let's go down now the risk faced by AI-based systems. Now, I just want to say that this is where we go down a rabbit hole of some stuff. So bear with me. I'm going to try to make this as entertaining as possible. But before I do, here's some true or false questions. So the first one we got here is securing the communication channels between distributed AI components is less important than securing the AI model itself. If you believe this is false, raise your hand. Congratulations, you are correct. Next one. The use of AI-generated synthetic data in training models can eliminate the need for data security and privacy measures. If you believe this is true, raise your hand. Ah, if you believe this is false, raise your hand. Nice, I was trying to trick you there for a quick sec. OK. So I think one of the things is that we tend to get a lot confused between what is an AI model from an AI system. So let's kind of talk about that really briefly. So an AI model is a mathematical or a computational construct designed to learn from data and make predictions or decisions based on that learning. It is the core component that processes input data, extracts patterns, and generates outputs. Now, AI systems are different. So an AI system is a complete setup that encompasses the AI model along with the necessary infrastructure and processes required to deploy, operate, and maintain the AI functionality. It includes the AI model and additional components such as data pipelines, user interfaces, and deployment mechanisms, monitoring tools, and security measures. So, just for you to know the difference between these two groups. Functionality, the AI model handles data processing and decision making, whereas the AI system ensures the model can be effectively 
used in the real world. And that means like the data management, the user interaction, and the system maintenance. Now, when you think about components between the two, an AI model consists of algorithms and learned parameters, while an AI system includes the model plus additional components like data pipelines, deployment environments, and user interfaces. So when we think about, well, who are these people that are trying to go after AI? Well, it's the usual three, right? It's the nation states, the competitors, and the cyber criminals. And on the side, you can see all the reasons why. They all are incredibly valid. So think about it as like your annoying neighbors are trying to steal your Wi-Fi. You know, they're out there. They want what you got, especially your cat memes, you know? Anyway, so we're going to go into some of the risks faced by AI systems. And that includes prompt injections, of course. We're going to talk about prompt injections. Um, but data poisoning and more. And it can really do feel like a bad episode of Black Mirror, but in real life. But like I said, I'm going to try to make this entertaining as possible, but I'm also going to try to do it like as if you're in a college session now. So let's go first down to data poisoning attacks. So model training is a critical phase in developing AI solutions where the model learns from the training data set. So malicious interference such as data poisoning can severely impact the model's reliability. Data poisoning attacks aim to manipulate the model's behavior by altering existing data or injecting doctorate data. Now, AI systems using continuous learning are particularly vulnerable as they do continually retrain on new user supplied data, which may not be properly validated, let's be honest. So consequently, adversaries can actually introduce specific inputs to the bias, the model, even a small amount of poisoned data can lead to bias or incorrect predictions if amplified by public manipulation or botnets. So think about it as you're a chef and you add too much salt to your dish. It makes it terrible. But one of my favorite examples is Tay, which launched on Twitter, well now known as X, um, in March 2016. Tay was this really innocent being on, on X and it was, it was so excited to meet the world. But you know, within 16 hours, users manipulated it to produce the most rude, racist, harmful content imaginable. Although this was not a coordinated attack, it still impacted Microsoft and also had threats of legal action as well. And there are definitely more data poison attacks. My favorite one is the artist trying to get back at Gen AI by using a tool which would allow them to do some data poisoning themselves up on the top right, right there. All right, now we get to go model evasion attacks. So evasion attacks is like trying to trick your teacher into thinking that you did your homework and your dog ate it, okay? They knew you were lying, but you're trying whatever you can to try to get them to be convinced. So inference attack targets AI models after deployment, and this is either on endpoints or in the cloud. And these attacks extract sensitive information about the model or its trained data by curing the model and analyzing its outputs. Attackers only need to access to the model's predictors, usually through the UI or the API. By repetitively sending slightly varied queries, attackers can understand and potentially reconstruct the model, leading into a model bypass or even theft itself. Evasion attacks is a type of model bypass that uses adversarial examples, which is basically like inputs subtly altered to classify something with a misclassification. These modifications are often not noticeable to humans, to be honest. Um, such techniques um, are like adding invisible noise to an image, for example. And these techniques have been used to bypass spam filters, as we know of, malware detection, biometric authentication as well. And it has been used for a good number of years now, by the way. Now, I want you to imagine you're in a self-driving car, all right? You get to the stop sign, and your car, instead of just going to a complete halt, what it does, it steps one foot over, taking back three steps, y'all, one hop this time. If you know what I'm doing is the cha-cha slide in heels, which is a little bit harder to do on this carpet. But imagine if your car could do the cha-cha slide by, because they saw a stop sign that looked like this, which has little stickers on it. True story, 
there was an incident where this did happen. Granted, the car didn't do a cha-cha slide, and I don't even know what a car would look like when it did cha-cha slide, but we could use all our imaginations, right? But what happened in the self-driving car was that when it saw this sign, which had these stickers on it, it decided to bypass the rules and went straight through the stop sign. Another good model evasion attack situation is the one that you see up here. So basically these type of attacks can also target facial recognition with modified sunglasses, but also military systems through deceptive imagery as that you see on this slide right here. And this can pose really significant risks, such as just painting fake bomber jets on the ground, apparently. So model theft attacks. So adversaries may target AI models not just to mislead them, but also to steal the models themselves. IP theft in AI involves replicating or extracting sensitive data from advanced AI solutions developed by companies. Even without public access to model details, adversary can use inference attacks through user interfaces or APIs to replicate the model or extract valuable information. Oracle attacks involve understanding the model's architecture and the parameters to create surrogate models or steal sensitive data. Now, according to NIST, raise your hand if you know about NIST. Good, I'm, I'm glad you all know about NIST. Um, so NIST defines Oracle track attacks in three different categories. One, you have extraction attacks. This is when you're trying to extract the model structure. You have your inversion attacks, and this is when you're reconstructing the training data. And then you have your membership inference attacks, which is trying to determine a specific sample as part of a training data. One of my favorite ones to study is the model theft attack when it came to TikTok and ChatGPT. Raise your hand if you have TikTok on your phone. Good. What? No. Why? Oh, OK. All right. You have it on a separate device without your personal stuff, hopefully. We'll just say you did. OK, OK, it's all right. It's OK. You're, you'll, you'll get so nervous and paranoid after this week. Don't worry. It's going to happen. But yeah, so you all are aware of TikTok. It's owned by ByteDance. Well, ByteDance got caught last year trying to make a replica of ChatGPT's model. And they actually called it, the code name was Project Seed, believe it or not. So when we think about model theft attacks, Think about it as like you're stealing someone's Netflix account. You like you get the service, but without the guilt of pain. All right, let's put in some true and false in here. So AI models that use transfer learning are less susceptible to security risks because they leverage pre-trained models. If you believe this is true, raise your hand. If you believe this is false, raise your hand. Congrats, you are correct. Next one. It is unnecessary to apply the principle of least privilege to an AI system component since they're all part of the same application and need full access. If you believe this is false, raise your hand. Congratulations, you are correct once again. So yeah, we're going to have to talk about prompt injections. I know it's like the one thing that everyone talks about when it comes to security for AI, but we'll have to talk about it. But uh, one way to understand it is, imagine you have a roommate, and they have a parrot. And you think it would be funny to teach that parrot to swear without your roommate knowing. Now, let's also pretend that your roommate is hosting a Thanksgiving dinner. And he's bringing all of his friends over, his family as well the grandma, the grandpa, everyone. And they might be going around the circle saying grace or maybe about what they're grateful for for the year. But then out of nowhere, this pair screeches like, God damn it, really, really loud. You know how embarrassing that would be in the middle of that really nice dinner? That's prompt injection. You're trying to teach it to do something that it wasn't meant to do in the first place. But I'll give you a more descriptive Thing around it. So to prevent misuse, Gen AI providers implement secure restrictions to filter such harmful content, to block access to illegal information, and to prevent aiding in illegal activities. These are also known as, anyone know? Guardrails. So these filters also ensure compliance with policies and laws. However, these restrictions can be bypassed using a technique called prompt injection 
where a specially crafted prompts trick an AI bot into performing a restricted action. And this can lead to chatbots executing actions originally blocked by their developers, with methods varying by model type, version, and tuning. Multimodal prompt injection is a technique used to manipulate not just text, but also images, audio, and video. And by crafting specific prompts across these different modalities, attackers can actually alter the AI model's behavior, leading to unintended or harmful outputs. And this method exploits the AI ability to integrate diverse information, making it a sophisticated form of attack that poses significant challenges for ensuring the security and the integrity of AI systems. And then you have indirect prompt injections. Now these work to manipulate an AI system's behavior by subtly altering the context or the environment rather than directly feeding it manipulated props. This can actually involve changing surrounding text, modifying the data, sources, or influencing the system's inputs indirectly. And this technique is so, so subtle and incredibly hard to detect, which is making things incredibly challenging when it comes to securing AI. And then you got code injection, which is basically like, you know, trying to teach Siri to prank call your boss. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, but basically, code injection, think about it as this way. So Gen AI models are typically limited to generating text, images, or sound, and cannot execute actions like running shell commands or scanning networks. However, they might generate fake outputs suggesting such actions were performed. Hidden Layer themselves discovered that some of the AI models can execute user-provided code. For an instance, Streamlit Math GPT application actually converts the prompts into Python code. This is then what happens is the model executes the answer of those math questions, of course. But the approach does allow for arbitrary code execution through prompt injection, which is one of those things that is incredibly dangerous when we're running on user-supplied code. And of course, we have to talk about supply chain attacks, because this wouldn't be a security talk without mentioning supply chain attacks. So think of it as the Trojan horse, um, but instead of soldiers, it's full of corrupted data. So supply chain attacks occur when a trusted vendor is compromised, leading to products with malicious components. Notable examples include SolarWinds, which caused a widespread security breaches and ransomware. Anyone where it was in that room during that time? The SolarWinds? Yeah, well, it's okay if you don't want to raise your hand. That was scary. Um, but anyway, these attacks exploit trust and have extensive reach, making them particularly dangerous, as you're all probably aware of. Now, the ML supply chain does involve various tools and services that do increase these type of risk. And 75% of IT leaders viewing third-party AI integrations as especially risky, organizations must adapt to security controls to address these new vulnerabilities. So think about like a supply chain attack situation is like you're, you're expecting a very high-end music festival, maybe a Taylor Swift concert or something, but instead you end up at the fire festival, you know, F-Y-R-E festival. Anyone see that documentary either on Hulu or Netflix? Raise your hand. Yeah, no, that, that was empty promises and chaos all over. So the thing to know is that there are these specialized repos like Hugging Face, which hosts over 500,000 models that are pre-trained, which make it incredibly easy for developers to integrate these models into their applications. However, if an attacker breaches this repo, they can actually replace the models with hijacked or backdoor models versions. And this does lead to significant downstream consequences. So think about a backdoor model is like a pizza with hidden anchovies. You take a bite and then you realize, oh my god, I have so much regrets with this pizza. So a skilled adversary can tamper with an AI's model algorithm to alter its predictions by injecting a specially crafted neural payload into a pre-trained model. This introduces a secret unwanted behavior known as the model backdoor which can then be triggered by specific inputs defined by the attacker to produce a desired output. Skillfully backdoor model appears accurate with regular data, but misbehaves with inputs manipulated in a specific way known only to the adversary. And this knowledge can be sold or used to ensure favorable outcomes for customers, such as loan approvals or insurance policies. So the thing to know about machine learning model is that when it's stored, it has to be serialized into a binary form. 
because it's so large. Um, but many widely used serialization formats, such as TorchScript used by PyTorch, HDF5, which is used by Keras, and then SaveMall, which is used by TensorFlow, are all incredibly vulnerable to arbitrary code execution. And these vulnerabilities allow adversaries to create malicious models or to hijack legitimate ones to execute malicious payloads. Hijack models can then serve as initial access points for attackers or spread malware to downstream customers and supply chain attacks. Now, the thing to know about machine learning development, it does rely on so many tools and frameworks, many of which lack adequate security controls, which include basic authentication. And this poses a real risk for data breaches and supply chain attacks. Security has often been an afterthought. Unfortunately, let's be honest, it is very much true. We are always reactive, not proactive, which has led to vulnerabilities in so many popular ML frameworks. And recently, there was a malicious PyTorch nightly build that was compromised via the Torch Triton package, which did allow data exfiltration from affected hosts. So when you're thinking about ML tooling, security is like locking your doors but keeping the windows open. Where do you think the burglar is going to come in from? Anyway, so very, very cool, 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 cool. If anyone has seen any uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, raise your hand. Yeah, I love that show. That's how I feel almost on a daily basis when I look at the stuff that's happening. And I know that this might be scary too, as all of us in the security space only having to learn the skills like really fast. It is scary because there's not a lot out there right now when it comes to training folks. So let's go talk a little bit about the advancements of where we are and where we need to head. But I have two true or false questions for you. So the first one is adversarial robustness is the only security concern that needs to be addressed for deploying AI in critical applications. If you think this is false, raise your hand. Congratulations, you are correct. Next one. Federated learning improves the security of AI systems by allowing models to be trained on decentralized data without exposing the raw data to central servers. If you think this is false, raise your hand. If you think this is true, raise your hand. You are correct, it is true. Now, offensive tooling is tools designed to be good but are often used for mischief. It's like, you know, giving a teenager keys to your Ferrari. It's exciting, um, but a little potential for chaos. So there are a lot of offensive security tools that are originally for red teamers and pen testers out there, but they are also being used by malicious actors. As you see on here, these are some of the ones that um, really stand out most of the time, but there's a lot more that are missing on this slide. But these basically help to test and improve AI security, but also can be misused to facilitate attacks, making AI vulnerabilities more accessible to adversaries. And of course, if you have your offensive tooling and, your, and frameworks and all that, now you need your defensive frameworks. So think about it as like putting your AI in a protective bubble, it's safe, but don't forget that bubble can pop. So as new AI attack tools and techniques emerge, now you have to have a defensive approach to crucial to protect the technology. In the past two years, actually, a lot of cybersecurity organizations and companies have developed comprehensive frameworks with security practices, strategies, and recommendations for AI, which is a great initial steps for safeguarding AI systems, but they're still we're playing a game of catch up. And what I mean by that, there's still gaps, unfortunately, in these. But don't worry, everyone's kind of working together and trying to keep it ongoing and updating it as best as possible. Now, policies and regulations, they're kind of like the rules of monopoly. Like, no one reads them, but everyone are, like agrees about them or maybe argues about them, I could say more. So AI does have a potential for harm. So it is critical for us to work together and, and create policies that's good. And as we know around the world, that's what is happening right now with the EU Act, which has been a little bit controversial in some ways because it is very restricted. And what has happened is that it has started to create some limitations on innovation, but also in a sense of not creating a healthy competition. So if you are a startup or a small company, it is incredibly hard to follow along and try to innovate something new. So the U.S. has taken a different take on this, which is like, you know, 
It's all about free markets, right? So it's like we want a healthy competition. We want people to innovate. So that's why you haven't seen anything like the EU AI Act happening in the US. Instead, you have the executive order, which is about, hey, you know what would be good? Red teaming. However, there's still work to be made, such as what is red teaming in AI? Define it. What should be the scope of it? And these things are kind of missing still, but they are in conversations at this time on trying to do so. Now let's go down some predictions and recommendations. And unfortunately, I only have, these are the last two true or false questions. So give it all you got now, right? So securing the training data of an AI system is not as critical as securing the AI model itself. If you believe this is false, raise your hand. Excellent, good job. All right, the last one. Model inversion attacks can extract sensitive information from the outputs of AI models by exploring the relationships learned during training. If you believe this is true, raise your hand. Congratulations, you either knew this knowledge or you paid attention in this heat. And by the way, congrats, it is hot in here. I feel for you, so thank you for staying in this room with me. So questions to always ask at the end of the day is when it comes to AI security, what are you doing to manage your AI cyber risks? Is it enough? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I think, I think we're good. How do you know? That now becomes a conversation where you actually have to talk to other departments and teams and hope that they will talk back, not at you, but with you. And that's where we are right now. The only way that we're going to fix the situation is to actually know how bad is our situation. How bad is our silos at our organization at this time? And no, you know, trying to turn it off and on again is not going to count, so don't even try. IT crowd fans representing them here, hopefully. Yeah, I love IT crowd. I go watch that every single day. Okay, so here are some predictions for 2024. I think you all can read this. It's a beautiful and nice slide. But basically, in general, more AI attacks, more supply chain issues. And I'm really, really, really hoping that us in this room, in the hacker space, that we start learning these skill sets. And I know it's also kind of a fault on organizations for not helping you either. Because right now, we're all playing a game of catch up. You know, there aren't really any certs out there that could help bring you to where you need to be at this time. So, I know that they're working on it, so do keep your eyes open. I know by beginning of next year, you'll have a lot more content to learn. Um, but if you really want to learn more about this space, um, Hidden Layer does have a research portal, so you can actually learn the latest case studies that we've done and the research we've done as well. And you can actually learn the techniques of how we went about it. But I do have one more prediction, which is possibly robot ta cats taking over Instagram. I really wish that that would happen, because that would make Instagram a little bit more exciting for me. So, so these are the last recommendations here, and it's by each group of the process that we have when it comes to AI. So in the design phase is simply to do your data source evaluation. Where did it come from, right? That's what we need to know. We need to know where did our data come from. But also to know the model robustness evaluation, also where did we get our model from? Has there been any cases with this model? And in pre-deployment is to do model integrity checks, of course, and also doing security scanning um, to look for any vulnerabilities already in existence. But also, one of the things that's not in here is we should also be doing AI red teaming. And I know that's still being developed of what that scope should look like, and, the, and hopefully we'll have more of a definitive thing for everyone, standards, so we can all agree on. But last but not least in the post-deployment is to, you know, monitor your input and outputs, but also to ensure you have a good overall security hygiene, which shouldn't be too hard if we become more proactive. And a lot of this talk is about us becoming more proactive now, because being reactive is not going to help the situation, as we've all learned. So, regular update and monitor AI systems is one of the top ones. The other one is to use adversarial testing. And then last but not least, educate your users and your employees of all the AI risks that exist out there. And these are the last key takeaways, which is AI is powerful but vulnerable, don't forget. I think we all kind of knew that though. Um, security requires constant vigilance and stay informed and be proactive, please. 
Now, I know I work in security and you work in security, but we trust each other, right? There's a beautiful QR scan code right here if you want to do it. Um, but this is where you could get a copy of the report. It is free, so feel free to, uh, to get the report. It is great if you ever need a summary of what this conversation was about. It goes into everything that I talked about. But last but not least, I know almost at time, and this is not relevant whatsoever, but Stanford is doing a study right now about figuring out what is going on in the workforce and are you safe? This is an incredibly important study and I really hope that you all can take a picture of this and share it with friends or colleagues because the more information, the more we speak up about our cases and our situations, we actually have data to do something about it. If we don't speak up, who will? Your data uh, it will be completely private, like no one will ever know your name or anything like that will ever get out there. So I really do recommend, please pass this forward. We need this information more than ever before. I know I don't really have a lot of time for Q&A, but I just wanted to put that out there. Um, but thank you so much for existing. Thank you for being here. Thank you for dealing with this heat. Thank you for being in Vegas for this wonderful Hacker Summer Week. And thank you for B-Sides once again for having me. And thank you to the volunteers for being in this room and making this such an amazing event. So thank you all for being here. All right, we're going to open it up for questions now. I also can take questions privately if that's more comfortable. I'm more than happy to do it outside of the room or right up here. Whatever works best for y'all. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Chloe. Thank you.